All right, four o'clock. Last session of the day, right? Everybody's tired. They want to go bowling as a pantheon thing, right? Everybody know about that? Anybody big bowlers? One, one big bowler back there? I sure am. Okay. I'm not a big bowler at all. Like, like in high school, my friends, and I think the reason why I'm not a big bowler is when I was in high school, my friends would go and they would always do something dumb, like throw the ball down when the gate was down and crash it, or they'd run out and steal the bowling shoes. And I think that's why I don't like bowling now as an adult. Um, I don't know. No bowling. I'll be there. Hopefully there's good food. Hang out, talk, good people, and food. So uh, I'm here today to talk about the managing uh, the human side of technology, uh, leadership in times of change. My name is Jeff McWhorter. I'm the COO at Gravity Works. Gravity Works is a fully, fully distributed digital agency. Uh, I founded it in 2009, and we have grown into 25 people. Um, and like I said, we're fully distributed. I live in Michigan, um, but we have a couple employees in the back there, another Michigan folks, and then North Carolina as well. Um, so really excited because um, DrupalCons uh, enable our team to get together and just have conversations with our team and meet other people um, and then get to share some, some information. So a couple disclaimers um, about the talk. Uh, I have one story in here that I'm gonna drop the F-bomb on. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm use the F-word on one of these things, so strong language, so get the parental advisory thing in the bottom, right? Um, so I'm gonna address the F, I have the F-bomb in there. Um, I'm trying to think of other things I wanted to disclose. Um, I posted on LinkedIn about this talk, that I was gonna give the talk, and when I did it, I went back and I researched that I have 27 years experience in the industry. And I'm excited to give this talk because it's a lot of those stories just kind of coming. Um, and I have a story for everything, but I like to hear other people's stories. So um, uh, one of my stories, uh, before I get into it, is I gave a um, presentation at the Toronto Code Camp many years ago. And uh, the keynote was talking about performance testing, uh, web apps. And my talk was not the keynote, and I was talking about uh, web apps and performance testing. So I went into that talk, and I said, and the, the keynote's name was Carl. I went into the talk, and I was like, well, I'm not going to cover this because Carl talked about this. I'm not going to cover, cover this because Carl talked about this. Well, most of the people weren't in Carl's talk and had no idea who Carl was and what I was talking about. So some of the things that I'm gonna cover, um, uh, Mr. Flag in the keynote today, um, talk a little bit about it. Um, and I'm gonna dive in a, a little bit inside of there as well. Um, so getting into it, um, everybody came to this talk for a reason. Does anybody wanna share what piqued your interest, what, you're, what you'd like to get out of the talk? Make sure that I'm catering to the audience needs. I think it's always interesting see this part of everything. Like a lot of a lot of folks, especially like developers, get thrown into managing uh, positions and they have the technical side of it figured out but not the people side of it. Yeah. Uh, and it's always harder. I, I, I mean I've done both. it's easier to uh, wrestle with Drupal than it is to wrestle with uh, some folks. So um, yeah. so yeah that's part of it. People problems, yeah. Um, I'm a developer who's been trying to management and uh, also, and I'm struggling right now with some new technology adoption stuff. Uh, we, we are going in a certain direction technologically and some people are hugely on board in my department and some people are digging in their heels. So I have some sort of mental models about what might be, or emotional models about what I think might be happening for them. But um, more perspective on that kind of problem in order to get buy-in is always helpful. Awesome, cool. I got some some tips in there for that for sure. I saw that. Yeah, um, the, the, the one I want to say that I, I refer to a lot to my team is, um, it's like The Walking Dead. Like, if you ever watch The Walking Dead show, um, zombies are predictable, right? You know that they're going to come after you, you can build a wall, you know what's going to happen with that. It's the people that's not predictable. So in our world, clients are predictable, right? Those clients are the zombies. Go faster. I'm going to change the due date. You know, we know all the things that the clients are going to do, but your employees and the people that you work with, can you please tell this person to not clip their toenails? No, I don't want to tell them not to clip their toenails. You tell them, right? But as a leader, these are the things that we need to do. <laughs> tell people about clipping toenails, exactly. Yeah. Um, and yes, that's a true story. 
And it's so nice working distributed where you don't have to deal with that, but you have different problems. One other disclaimer that I remind, uh, uh, I thought of is um, this image right here was created by our, our creative director. Everything else is uh, using mid-journey. So uh, lots of AI uh, um, generation inside of here. And the theme for this talk is going to be gnomes. Lots of gnomes inside of here. So uh, the first thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, the difference between a, a manager and a leader. Um, so as a manager, you have project managers. Uh, managers focus on the process and the tasks versus leaders who are focusing on the vision and the goal and people. Managers are short-time goals uh, versus leaders who are thinking about the future and, and long-time goals. Um, empathy, leaders have empathy. They have uh, personal influence. Um, they take risks and change. Um, the, the example I like to use is um, a manager at McDonald's on their downtime is not going to start serving spaghetti because they think it's a good idea. So that's the difference between a manager and a leader. If they were a leader, they might think, hey, let's start serving pizza. Let's see how we can boost those, that, that revenues. So um, as the gentleman in the, in, in the back mentioned, um, a lot of us uh, started off as developers. My background was I was a developer. And uh, throughout the years uh, of running a business, I turned into a manager. So how did I go from a developer to a manager into a leader? Um, it was a very long, long transition with um, a lot of work. Um, some make this transition very quickly, and some will never make it at all. Um, and one person uh, that I worked for many years ago um, did not make this transition at all. Um, and I have some stories in here we're going to talk about a little bit about it, but um, his, uh, we'll refer to him as Bad Boss. And, and folks at Gravity Works have all heard Bad Boss stories. Um, and I'll start off um, with this one that's not super bad, but just think about it a little bit. Um, it was my first job right out of college and um, didn't have any money. And he really wanted to go out to lunch every single day. Go out to lunch and go to like, like uh, Olive Garden and things like that. I'm still eating, I'm in college, right? Like right out of college, I'm still eating ramen. And what he would do is he would trick us, me and another guy, he would say, we're going out, we're gonna talk work. We're gonna talk business. That was a cue for me that, okay, we're gonna talk business, you're gonna buy us lunch. Nope, gotta pay for my own lunch. It's not that bad, but when we would go to Olive Garden, we had to get soup, salad, and breadsticks. We weren't allowed to order off the menu because it took too long. So you had to get that. Couldn't order off the menu or else he would have a big deal. We'll get to more bad boss stories in a little while. So making this transition from developer to manager to uh, leader, I, I really thought a lot about how we value things. Um, how we value people, how we value things. Um, and the thing that came to mind when I was thinking about how we value things is Magic the Gathering. Has anybody played Magic? Any Magic people out there? Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it, right? It costs, it costs some money here. So much money. Um, for a piece of cardboard, right? It's a card game. And as you pay more money, you get stronger cards. And you know, it's a collectible thing and everything. And this is you know, one of the rarest cards that's out there. It's called the Black Lotus. Um, and it's $850,000 to buy this card. People buy these things. Um, versus the, the friend group that we had when I was into Magic, we would just draw this on a piece of paper and you draw it and then you can play it, right? We don't need the $850,000 card to do this. Um, which really makes me, me think about, you know, how do you value people? How do you value the people that you're around? How do you value um, your work? How do you value your family? So this is something that, that folks have been thinking about a very long time, um, a quote by Aristotle. Um, why water is vital for all life is cheap, while diamonds are expensive even though we can live without them. So it really makes you think that this is something that we've been struggling with for a very long time about how people value things. Um, I know when I was younger in my career, I would um, make fun of people who worked at the state of Michigan. That's where people go when their career dies. But now I'm a little bit different, kind of like those people work nine to five and they're not worried about what happens afterwards and they go home and spend it with their family. Right? So I value work 
more than I valued family back then. Um, and back then it was just me and my wife, and I loved my wife, but I loved work too. I used to work so many hours, um, and I got a lot of fulfillment from it. But everybody that we manage is going to be different. There are going to be some people who really get a lot out of working those hours. Um, and that kind of gets into ownership a little bit too. Um, you get folks who take a lot of ownership inside of a project, and it's really hard when somebody is so vested in a project to tell them, here's your priority of things to work on. Because they're so vested in that project, they love that project, they're like, well, I don't think that's the most important thing. I think this is, and it gets really tough with that. So again, we'll talk a little bit about ownership in a little while as well. This is another one that I think um, great leaders do. It's uh, what gets measured gets managed. Um, this is something we do at Gravity Works, and it goes up and down with how we use this. Um, this is called Office Vibe, and it's a quick little survey that's sent out uh, every week, and it kind of gives some ideas of how are you doing at work. Uh, it asks a question, and we can cater the questions, but we keep them pretty much what the tool developed, and um, it uses um, an ENPS score. So net promoter score um, for folks on the marketing side is how much value customers are getting uh, uh, from your services. The E uh, NPS is for employees. So this is like a calculated number, um, but it gives you an idea of where, where we are with things. Um, you can see we have it grouped in our different teams, the back end, front end, managers, uh, project managers, and UX team. Um, and you can see definitely varying levels of participation. Sometimes the, uh, we don't get enough people participating in the survey to know, um, so it, it can't be anonymous. Um, and when I'm fully vested and I have time to do this, because I mean, as leaders, we have to prioritize things that we're working on. Um, I look at this and I'm not too worried about like a 7.7 .7 score. I'm worried if the score drops. I want to make sure that it at least stays the same or it goes higher. If I see that the score get, is dropping, um, then we know that we need to have a conversation and we need to talk with folks. The other thing is I know when we are heads down on projects and we have lots of deadlines that we're working with, um, the participation goes way down um, and uh, folks aren't responding, folks aren't doing that, and I get it because yes, they just don't have the time to respond to the, the couple questions that they have. So as a, as a leader, uh, it's really important to move on. And I think as uh, me being a business owner and a leader for many years, this is one of the biggest things that I struggle with. Um, I'll work on an RFP to respond to a project. I think that will be great for, for this proposal. Um, I'll work so hard on it. I'll work on it into the evenings. And then um, I'll get an email back that says, thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. And then I'm kind of like, can you give me a little bit more information? You know, we work with. 15 athletic associations and you're an athletic association why did you not like it because we pitched Drupal we don't have to use Drupal you use WordPress if you really want you know it's those sort of things um, I have a really hard time moving on um, and uh, this is a quote that really helps helps me and call it out for, for anybody who knows what this is going to be but um, actually before I even do it does anybody know the quote I'm going to say on this before I do it Kurt shaking his head you know what the happiest animal in the world is? I heard it? Goldfish. Goldfish, because it has a 10 second memory. <laughs> Be a goldfish. Ted Lasso. <laughs> Who has not seen Ted Lasso? Oh my God. Okay, that is your homework. Is like, <laughs> This show is amazing, and it shows, I forgot what my other uh, disclaimer was. I'm gonna cheer up. I get really emotional, like when I start talking about things in Kurt's life. <laughs> I'm going to cheer up on some of these things, so don't be surprised when that happens. So Ted Lasso like changed my life. Like I watch this, and I'm like, I want to be this guy. This guy is like really good with people and does all this awesome stuff, um, which really made me start to think. Is I think that we as a society reflect a lot of what we do based on what's in the media. Um, so what sort of managers have we seen in, in the media, right? We got Mr. Burns, we have uh, 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 Picard, who's good. Uh, we're in DC area, Jed Bartlett, who's amazing, right? Um, 
the office. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting, right? So these are the folks that we look up to in business, um, and sometimes we want to act like them. To the point of when I was a young manager, I can always remember there was something, there was a show, and somebody came in, and they were talking about something, and the manager said, can you shut the door? And the person went to go shut the door, and the manager was like, no, on the other side. And I thought that was the funniest thing in the world until I actually said it to an employee, and I felt like shit about saying it because I was like super stressed out, and I'm just like, can you just please leave me alone? I don't need you coming here right now. And I learned a valuable lesson that day that a lot of the stuff that we get is coming from the media. I don't see a lot of women leaders there either. So here's my slide on women leaders. Um, again, we have a mix here of who do you want to be? Do you want to be... Um, like, like, like Veep, do you want to be like Shiv Roy from, from Succession? I mean, these are a lot of the role models that we start, start seeing, um, and we need to be careful about that. So going on, um, talking a little bit about um, Ted Lasso. Um, so the premise of that show is uh, Ted Lasso, and I'm not going to throw many spoilers out there, but Ted Lasso is an American football coach who goes over to the UK to coach uh, uh, UK like, like European soccer, football. And um, he's set up for failure, but he's always happy. And along, along the journey, he's changing people's lives and helping them, um, which really got me thinking about coaching. Um, I live in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, home of Michigan State University, which affords me the ability to see lots of coaches in action. Um, I'm able to go to uh, gymnastics and volleyball and swim meets for free. Um, I have uh, uh, a 12 and an eight year old, so we go to all these sporting events. We also go to the arts and go to Wharton and stuff like that to watch theater. But it affords me to watch coaches. And I went on this kick for about two years where um, I really watched coaches. I watched how they interact with their, with their athletes. Um, also, my oldest daughter is in competitive cheer, and um, competitive cheer coaches are known for being yelly coaches, where they're constantly yelling and, and trying to get out of their athletes. Um, but I watched um, Tom Izzo, the basketball coach there, I watched how he interacted with his, his, his athletes. Um, and I, another thing I'm fortunate of is I had a really good friend in the tech industry that his son played for Tom Izzo, and his son is now a head coach at Kalamazoo College. So I got this brainy idea. I'm going to call this coach at Kalamazoo College. I'm going to talk to the dad first and see if the, the, the kid will talk to me. And I'm going to talk, what was it like being coached by Tom Izzo? What lessons did you learn from, from um, uh, being underneath him that you bring on to, to your athletes? And I think that there's a lot of things that we can bring um, over from the coaching world over into, uh, in, into business. Um, and a lot of it is, is being vested um, in people. Um, this is the pyramid of success from John Wooden. He was the UCLA basketball coach. Um, and this is, um, you know, you hear a lot about this like with like, like team building and things like this. Uh, it, when you're watching Ted Lasso, look for this um, as an Easter egg inside of his office. Um, it, it, it's up there. Um, but there's lots that we can learn from, from coaches. Um, the thing that, um, the story that I got from, uh, that I confirmed from, from this coach from Kalamazoo College that went under Tom, Tom Izzo, um, I've always heard a story that um, there were two players, or there was a player um, that was in early shoot free throws. He's in there, six o'clock in the morning, he shoot free throws. He's smiling because he sees Coach Izzo walking in, and um, he says, hey coach, I'm here early, and he said, where's the rest of your team? Right, so it's about bringing your team together. You know, it, it, it's not just a single person's efforts, it's bringing everybody together. What are you doing to make your team stronger, not just yourself? It's not just about you, it's helping support others. And I think that's exactly what leadership is, is it is what can you do to prop others up? What can you do to help support them? What can you do to make them better? You don't get a medal for last place. Um, I'm going to write a book with this title one day. Um, my youngest daughter was at a cheer competition, and um, she came out afterwards, and I said, where's your medal? She's like, Dad, you don't get a medal for last place. And I think in, in the world today, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of things about um, partition patient trophies. Are they good? Are they bad? There's lots of studies on this and everything. Um, but really what I take away from this is 
they worked hard, right? And they went to this cheer competition. It was in Tennessee, and we traveled. We traveled all this ways to watch a cheer competition that's literally two minutes and 30 seconds long. And I want to make sure that you're happy and you get something out of it. I was happy watching you. Are you happy? Um, so this is something I know at Gravity Works um, we can definitely do better at is um, we need to celebrate the wins. And um, I think celebrating the wins with your team individually, even if you're just like, oh, that felt so good. Um, with the RFPs, I mentioned that if we lose one, I get really hard on myself. I need to better, be better when we win one. It's not just, great, we got a project, let's move on. Let's, what's the next one? It's, it's taking a second and actually celebrating it. Um, so this is something um, way back when we had, um, when we weren't a fully distributed company. Um, anytime we launched a website, uh, there was a bakery like three doors down from our office and we would, <laughs> it was so weird, they thought we were so weird, we'd print out a picture of the website and we'd say, can you theme a cake that looks like the website? And we'd get things like this and this is what we would have and if it was a local client, we'd invite them and say, hey, why don't you come and have, have a cake with us? And it was just a really neat, uh, really neat thing to do um, that being a distributed company it, it, it's really tough and how do you do things with 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 that when you're a distributed company um, so an example um, not exactly of um, a distributed company win but kind of you know a thing that I thought was going to be very difficult being a distributed company um, a couple weeks ago our team was um, really heads down we were launching a, a new website uh, a Drupal 7 uh, migration for Western Michigan University. Huge site, right? Million nodes, just, just so much content, millions of links, um, and it was really tough, and they're working really hard. And I asked the other project managers on our team who weren't on the Western team, I said, can you help me order lunch for the people that are on the Western team? So they all took a person, and they all ordered them Jimmy John's because there's a Jimmy John's every place. And it was super easy, And except for Brittany who wanted something special and Brittany's back there and she had things downstairs and we had to do something special for her. But it was super simple and super easy. We need to start doing that more. Celebrate those wins, do those little things um, to help folks out. So, as you're making this transition from being uh, a manager, from a developer to a um, uh, developer, manager, leader, um, there's this term called cognitive re readiness. Um, so what uh, this is, is it's, 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 it's training, it's mental training that leaders can get um, uh, who work in, in complicated situations. So there's things that we can do, um, like critical thinking. How do you teach critical thinking? How do you teach problem solving? Adaptability, emotional regulation, which I clearly am horrible at because at some point in here I'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna end up crying. Um, resilience, um, agility, and communication skills. So cognitive readiness, are these are all skills that, that leaders need to have um, that you can get in various different mediums, um, learning and, and working on those. I think it's super important. <coughs> if you're on time, you're late. Um, is anybody in band or orchestra in, in elementary, middle school, high school? Okay. My band director used to say this all the time. If you're on time, you're late. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I'm like, this is amazing. This is awesome. Um, we do the website for the Michigan Band and Orchestra Association. So I'm having this conversation about my band director, and he said this thing, and I used the best band director ever. And he looked at me and said, all band directors say this. I'm like, what? Really? Yeah, apparently all band directors say this. Um, it destroyed my world. But I'm still going to throw it in here. I'm still going to say this. Um, uh, and one other story before I get to my point. Um, swim team, my daughters were doing swim team um, this year. The youngest, we just had the swim banquet, the youngest got the award for water wizard because she wore like a wizard robe to, to swim team every day. It was kind of cute, kind of cool. The oldest got the on time award. And she's like, what's this, the on time award? This isn't an award for me, this is an award for you, dad. And I'm just like, yep, you were there on time, 6 a.m. every morning, yep, you know it. Um, where I'm going with this one is, um, Setting examples, right? We are all busy, and um, everybody's time's different, right? Uh, yes, we work eight hours a day, but um, if you have a disability, that you, you might not be working that full eight hours. So we need to be careful about how we um, expect people to work their 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 hours in their day. Um, 
but we have to set priorities, right? It's, 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 it's not I don't have time for it, it's, I didn't prioritize this. Um, and it's, it's important to be on time for meetings as a leader because um, you're setting an example. And if you can't be on time, I think it's very important to set boundaries to change uh, those meeting times. Because if you're running from meeting to meeting to meeting and you're late from meeting to meeting to meeting, when are your employees going to be able to talk to you about things? Right? They're going to get that illusion that you are so busy that you don't have time for them. So if you're on time, you're late. Um, set boundaries and um, set an example. Um, Asana, Gantt chart, fun. Empowerment breeds confidence. Um, people need to learn their own lessons. Um, that's something that I as a leader have, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, people need to fail, but they need to be able to fail gracefully. Um, but uh, people need to make their own decisions and they have to do it. Um, I can't just come in and say, I have 27 years experience and you're gonna do it this way. Um, we need to work together and say, well, this, this happened like 10 years ago. This is what the situation was. If you think you wanna handle it different, let's try it and, 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 and do this differently. Um, this really isn't go with this slide, but it's a good chance to um, share this story. And this is probably the story I'm gonna cheer up a, a, about. Um, about an employee, um, we were a small organization. We were probably about seven people at the time, and we just landed a contract to redo the state of Michigan's website, like all the state of Michigan website. And we had a couple developers that were on site that would go there. Some would stay at, at the office at Gravity Works and, and work on it. Um, and I was just proud, like smiles. I was just so happy working on this. Um, and one night I got a call from the client about 10 o'clock at night, and she said, um, did you watch Crime Stoppers? And I said, no, I'm not a big news person. And she's like, well, Heather was on Crime Stoppers last night. Heather was the lead developer on the project. I'm like, oh. So the first thing I did was I called her, and what happened was uh, Heather's identity was stolen, and um, somebody used it to, to fence goods, but they were looking for Heather. So I had to take Heather off that project right away because it was a state contract. We had to take Heather off of it. Um, but what do you do in that situation? Because we need to take her off that, that project, and theoretically, I can have her working at Gravity Works, working at Gravity Works while it was because of the contract that we had with the state of Michigan. Um, so Heather's upset. Heather's like, maybe she's 20 at the time, maybe she's 21, and she doesn't know how to deal with this. So I said, Heather, let me call my lawyer and let me let, let me figure this out and let me see what I can do to help you. So I called my lawyer, and he's like. That's a, what the hell happened? This is, you need a criminal lawyer, what did you do? And I'm like, I didn't do anything, this is for an employee. Um, so we helped set her up with, with a, a criminal attorney to, to help set the situation. I don't know about you, but when I was 20, I sure didn't have the money to pay for a criminal lawyer as well. That's where I get teary. Don't worry, Heather, I'll cover it all. So, covered it all worked with a criminal attorney, um, got it all straightened out. Um, while she was not working at Gravity Works, she was continuing to work on other projects. Gravity Works was still paying her differently. Um, but it was the right thing to do, right? It wasn't that she did something wrong, it was just a shitty situation that happened, and we needed to get through it and figure it out. Um, me as a business owner now, that has all kinds of liability all over it with me doing something like that. But would I do it again? In an instant. Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Um, as a leader, um, succession planning, I think, is extremely important. And um, succession planning uh, is just a really fancy word um, for what Batman does in the Justice League. That's how I always explain it. Succession planning is, is not fun. So Batman, everybody knows who Batman is. Justice League is his like Avengers with a whole bunch of people. But Batman has a plan. He knows that uh, Superman uh, is vulnerable to kryptonite and Green Lantern, yellow pencils. Like He has this plan. If anybody goes rogue, he knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, that's what we have to do as leaders, is what is your plan when employees move on? Um, what is your plan if you lose a big client? Um, so always kind of looking to the future and looking for things and being nimble and being agile and, and, and talking with folks um, on your team about what you should do in situations. 
Focus on potential, um, not just performance. Um, I think our hiring practices throughout the years definitely have changed. Um, we were just talking, the Gravity Works folks, um, about a new hire that we had, and I, I may have said I didn't even look at her resume. Um, I, I did look at her resume for a second. But it's important that you have conversations with people and um, focus on potential. Um, a lot of folks at Gravity Works don't have um, technical degrees. Um, they have arts degrees. They have humanities degrees. And I think that um, a lot of folks would just pass them right by. Um, I have a really good friend who works at Microsoft on the Visual Studio team. Um, he's a program manager on the Visual Studio team. Um, and he went to a small college in Ohio and his degree is in jazz guitar. But he's not allowed to write code at Microsoft because he doesn't have a technology degree. And he is one of the smartest people that I've ever known, great coder, but they put him in a position where he still can be successful, um, but he's not writing code every day. Um, so I think it, it's really important, um, potential, not performance. Um, performance will come. Authenticity. Um, you know, being up here and talking about leadership and things we do, um, you know, it really questions, I, I question myself that, am I a good leader? Um, and I'm always looking to change, um, and I want to put out my true, authentic self. Um, let's do a bad boss story. Bad boss story, this, this is one of my favorite stories that I had to go through. So it's um, summer in Michigan, it's around 10 o'clock, the, um, uh, sun's coming through the, the window just like it is right here. Um, this is back in the day of MSN Messenger. Uh, bad boss messaged me, hey, can you come into my office for a second? Number one, there's no context in there, right? Boss is coming and he's saying, hey, can you come here for a second? You gotta give context, you gotta say, hey, nothing's wrong, can you come here for a second? Something like that. No context, again, 20, 21, 20 year old me, probably 21 year old me, I go into his office and he's on the phone. So he's talking on the phone, sun shining through. So the blinds like this, I go just like this. I just uh, start pulling down the blinds so the sun isn't coming in my eyes. So he's on the phone, so he covers the phone and he goes, if you touch my blinds again, I'll break your fingers. And then he just keeps going on with the conversation and stuff. I'm like, what? <sighs> he was uh, something else. Um, and I worked at a company for five years because, not because he was a bad boss, he was an excellent coder. He was amazing. And he, I picked up a lot of things. I'm not going to say he taught me a lot of things. I looked at his code, and I learned a lot of things from what he was doing. Um, and I met a friend there that I um, still have to this day that we were able to commiserate and talk about different things about bad boss and, and whatnot. Um, and I think a lot of my why I am the way that I am is because of bad boss. Why I run the company the way that I run the company is, is because of Bad Boss. So this is my favorite quote of all times. And I know the session before me was a Star Trek um, session. They talked a lot about Star Trek. And um, I'm definitely going to pick that one up and listen to that, uh, the recording on that one. But my favorite quote of all time it, uh, is from Jean-Luc Picard from Next Generation. Uh, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. Love that quote. Um, those RFPs that I was talking about, we lose the RFPs all the time. It's not that we made a mistake, just different. Vulnerability is a strength, not a weakness. Um, it took me a long time to come to terms that I'm an emotional person, to like be able to get up and like talk in front of people and know that I'm going to tear up. And I talk to my team, and it's like a running joke when we hire somebody new. It's like, do we tell them? Do we just like wait and see how freaked out they get that the boss is crying? <laughs> um, I like to put the disclaimer in front of it because people are, are, do get freaked out about it. They're like, what's going on? Um, but it's just, it, I've, I've come over the years to, to, to learn that it's because I care, right? I care about everything. Um, I presented at a conference once. Um, uh, 
and I can't remember the name of the conference, but there was one person in the session, and it was probably one of the best conversations I ever had because I took everything down and we just sat on a chair and we talked about the topic right there. And it's because I cared about that individual. I cared about teaching something that I had learned, some of my experiences, um, and our employees. I care about their families. I care that they're able to um, have uh, time with the families and whatnot. So going back to another story, back a couple slides, um, being authentic. Um, as I've made my transition from developer to manager to leader, um, I should not be writing code anymore. And I know I shouldn't be writing code anymore. But it hurts when the team is working on a project <clears throat> that they're working 100 hours a week trying to get something done. And that's not the norm. This was a, a, a definitely a specific thing. Um, I want to help them out in any way that I can. So entering content. What can I do to help constantly? What can I do to help? What can I do to help you? I think is extremely important. And then if they're saying nothing, just sitting there and being online, knowing that I'm there in case they need something is extremely important, at least to me. And hopefully the team sees that, that while you guys are working those hours, I'm there if you need me. Communication as a, le as a leader, I think is extremely important. Um, my, my kids, my eight-year-old and 12-year-old, has much better communications than my wife which is amazing because I ask my kids something, they're like, got it. I ask my wife something on, on, on like text her, don't hear from her for like two days. So <laughs> got it emails I think are extremely important. Um, as consultants, um, just letting people know, hey, I saw this, hey, I, I, I'm gonna get to this. Um, uh, but it goes more than just like those got it emails. One-on-ones, I think, are extremely important. Um, and I know that um, the bigger the organization, the more process you have around the one-on-ones and appraisals and everything like that. Um, and I like to say to break some of that process. I think it's fine to have those, those formal check-ins, but you need to have informal check-ins too. You need to make yourself available um, as a leader to talk with your team and see what is going on and, and, and what they are. Oh, here comes that word not the right fit. Um, sometimes you're gonna have people on your team and they're not gonna be the right fit. Um, so my dad was a roofer. Um, he owned his own company and I worked with my dad from the time I was little. I would go during the summertime and I would clean up scrap from the shingles that would come off. I put it in the truck. Um, and I was 16 years old and my dad went to go pick up like Home Depot or something to pick up some supplies or something. And um, I was picking up scrap and I turned the corner and two of his guys were smoking weed on the job. So I looked at them and I said, get the fuck out of here. And they looked at me and they're like, can you do that? I'm like, I just did, get out of here. And they did and my dad came back and he was like, where'd they go? And I'm like, dad, they were smoking weed on the job. And he kind of looked at me and I don't know what my dad would have did at the time. But I know how much workers' comp costs because I heard my mom and my dad talking all the time about how much workers' compensation insurance costs for a roofer. And I was like, if they're high and they fall off a roof, that's a problem, right? So it's not if you're, you know, what your beliefs are or anything like that. You just can't do that while you're roofing because there's lots of liability there. <clears throat> so my dad kind of looked at me and said, well, what are we going to do? We need to get the job done. So I said, we're going to get the job done. So we stayed late and we got the job done. And uh, that's the story how I fired my first person. So <laughs> it's not always um, as simple as that, right? I mean, that was a clear issue. Sometimes you have to let people go in situations where um, it, it's downsizing. It um, doesn't feel good. Um, going into the bad boss story again, Bad boss always used to call me into his office. I don't know why he would call me in. And he'd say, you are so lucky to have a job. I'm like, okay, interesting. You need to be proud of your employees that you have and know that they're, they can go out and you hired the best people, right? You wanna hire the best people. You wanna surround yourself by people that are smarter than you. Um, and I'm extremely proud that we've had people that have left Gravity Works to go work at Amazon and things like that. And I'm happy for them, that's great. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, so it, it goes back to succession planning and um, making sure that um, people expect that people are going to grow and they're going to move on and things. And you as the employer are lucky to have them. It's not the other way around for sure.
Um, so change, um, having two children that are in public schools, I, this is the thing that I wish public schools taught a lot more, and all schools in general, because this is what life is. This is what makes life awesome. This is what uh, we go through every single day is change. And knowing how to embrace change and live with change and deal with change is important. The impact of technological technological advancements on organizations. We have this big thing with AI right now that people are, I'm worried about my jobs, what are we going to do about? This is change, AI is a tool. How are we going to integrate it into our society um, to become a better society? And so the role of leaders in navigating change I think is extremely important because um, we're always gonna have change in organizations and we need to, to work with our team to, to recognize this and make it so that they're not scared. Don't judge a book by its cover. So when I was in elementary school, I had, I had a really good friend, and this is going back to about fourth grade, and my dad said, um, you need to watch out hanging out with that kid. And he didn't exactly say it like that, because if a parent says don't hang out with this kid, then of course you're gonna hang out with them. But he said, there, there's gonna come a day that this kid does something, and you're gonna get in trouble for it. He's gonna steal something, something's gonna happen. And my dad judged uh, that book by, by the cover. Um, a little bit about my dad. Um, my dad was a people person. He knows people. Um, we live in Michigan, but we took a trip out to California, and he was at a gas station, and he had his roofing hat on that said J&J Roofing, and somebody came up to him and said, is that the J&J Roofing in Roseville, Michigan? And my dad's like, yeah, and had an hour-long conversation with this guy. I'm like, Dad, how do you know somebody in California, right? My dad knew people, and I just thought that, you know, you can judge people. Right? You can look at somebody and you can judge them and say, hey, this person's going to be, you know, like after five minutes, you know, he's, he's not a good person to hang out with or whatever. How my dad got those biases, I have no idea. I thought I had that too. Like hiring people, I can look at somebody and tell them right away. I learned really quick and really fast. Don't judge a book by its cover. That is the worst thing my dad ever did. He was right though. That, <laughs> the, 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 the kid ended up going AWOL from the army. It was really bad. I don't know what my dad picked up on. He picked up on something, but it is not something that people should do, and I see a lot of managers do that. Um, they'll have an interview where they ask trivia questions. Um, you know, what's the latest version of Drupal? And things like that that are not great questions, and you're judging people by something that you can go look up on the internet in like 30 seconds. So I'm going to leave you with that. Um, we've got a couple minutes for questions. Um, but those are a few of my stories from the 27 years of leadership and management and uh, a couple bad boss stories inside of there. So, thank you. <laughs> Thoughts, questions? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did I miss it or did you not tell the story with the F-bomb? I did. The, 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 get the fuck out of here. Oh, okay. yeah. See, I, I slid it in there, right? I slid it in there. You did not notice it. He just wanted it on for it. Oh, he just wanted it again. <laughs> I'm sure it was spicier than some of 16 year old. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think those guys, like, they looked at me and they were like, can he do this? And he's like, oh, he's the boss's kid, I guess so. Also, they were stoned, so that was probably a yeah. conversation. Yeah. Like, we don't even want to work here anyway. They laughed right at me. Yeah, they laughed all the way. Yeah. <clears throat> but there's something like, like it was, roofers have a, um, I don't know the best way to say it. It, it. It's a very tough industry to find people that have licenses that can like drive. So when I was 16, my dad asked me to get a chauffeur's license so I could drive the dump trucks because he had a hard time finding people. And I would drive the dump truck to the job site He'd take me to school, I'd go to school all day, and then after school, he'd take me back to the, jo to the job site to drive the dump truck home. It's just, it's what the industry was. Which, if you look back on it, I mean, nowadays, it, 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 it's really sad, right? It, 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 it's tough. I do have another question. It has to do with, you know, your company, you said it's remote now, right? Yep. What do you, how have you changed your management going from working in person with people to remote? Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you this real quick, and I honestly think that um, 
this is the key to success, at least for us, for, for being fully distributed. Um, inside of Slack, we have a channel called Daily Status. And we've had this for years. And the idea with this is when you're working in an office, you can walk up to somebody and say, um, hey, I need help with this. But when you're in the distributed world, you don't know if that person is at their desk or not. So what happens is somebody picks up the phone and calls you while you're at the doctor's office or you're at this. So what we have is this daily status thing where the only rule I put in place was, can you please post in the morning what you're working on? And it has evolved into this thing where everybody is away from their keyboard. You, you can see lunch, 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 back, 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 lunch, lunch, lunch. So all of the project managers, before they know to contact somebody, they look here and they're like, oh, they're not even at their computer. They're not, you know, they're doing something different. Um, so I think that is, is one of the management styles um, that we've adopted. Um, it, it, people are more cognizant about the work. I think that they want to show that, you know, hey, you can't see me, but here's what I did. So we see a lot of that. So the work has definitely increased. Um, we do lightning talks every Friday, and we try to keep them like true lightning talks. Like I tell people, I don't want you to prep slides. If you want to talk about chickens, come talk about chickens. And we have a woman who raises chickens, so she came and talked about chickens. Um, I went to San Diego Comic-Con, and I talked about San Diego Comic-Con. And I think like things like that to instill that water cooler talk. We also have a, a weekly status that I run where we talk about business updates and things like that. It's always looking for ways to engage. Um, and like that Jimmy John thing that I told you is things like that that I really want to start doing a lot more of. But it's hard. All right. I'll be around if anybody has any questions. I'll be bowling. Not bowling, I'll be eating while everybody's bowling. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone.